Well, while they're loading up, um, I will just take this moment and opportunity to welcome you all to the Southside Cultural Center. My name is Valerie Tutson, and I am the uh, director of the Rhode Island Black Storytellers. And we are one of the cultural arts partners that's here in this building. Has anybody not been to this building before? I didn't mean to phrase the question that way. I meant to say, how many of you are here for the very first time? Yay! And you found your way around the building into our parking lot. So congratulations and thank you so much. You may have been here in the past because this has been a cultural arts hub for many, many years. This is where Trinity Rep started 40-some years ago. Uh, the Tapa School for the Performing Arts was also started here. And now at the Southside Cultural Center of Rhode Island, we are thrilled to be the home of the Rhode Island Black Storytellers, the Rhode Island Latino Arts, ALNE, which stands for Arte, Arte Latino New England, <laughs> Providence Improv Guild, the Wilbury Theater, the Cambodian Society, and the Laotian Society. So we do hope that you will check us out, on, you know, check out our website. You probably noticed in the parking lot when you came in that there was a garden area and this big pavilion space out there. That was created in partnership with the Rhode Island School of Design last summer. And we're really looking forward to doing a lot of outdoor programming this summer. So please be sure to get on our mailing list at the Southside Cultural Center of Rhode Island to find out um, how you can get involved and what else is happening here with our cultural arts partners. Uh, Richardson Ogadon is the executive director here, and we've just hired Yatande who, as our program director, so we're really excited about how that's going to help us uh, get more engaged and get more information out to the community at, about what's happening here. We're thrilled that this uh, Port Markers project uh, is here this evening, and I think that's all I need to say. <laughs> I was kind of just filling space, but yes, again, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are, oh, I know what I wanted to tell you. If you are so inclined, when this event is over this evening, the Providence Improv Guild is doing what they do every Thursday night here. They are hosting a night of improv. It's $5.00. They would probably even give you two, you know, they hand out these cards, two for one, five bucks, um, but they'll be doing improv in here at eight o'clock tonight. They're also here tomorrow night and Saturday night as well. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for bearing with us. I'm thrilled that you're here tonight. Uh, thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. My name is Matt Riley, and I'm a visiting assistant professor at Brown University. On behalf of the Rhode Island Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's lecture featuring Professor Shawande Mustakin. This, this event is part of a series organized by the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project. The Rhode Island chapter of this national organization seeks to acknowledge, commemorate, and memorialize the lives of those who suffered the brutality of the Middle Passage, in addition, in addition to confronting the role of the, that the slave trade played in economics, politics, and society. The project is currently organizing events and ceremonies in addition to designing and planning the installation of port markers. This project is an ongoing effort that aims to have a lasting impact in our communities for years to come. Additionally, it is a community-oriented project, and we encourage any interested community members to get involved. Please visit our website at rimiddlepassage.org for more information and to join our mailing list. Here you'll also find information about the final lecture as part of this series, which will feature Professor, Professor Wendy Warren of Princeton University, who will be discussing her new book, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, New England Bound, Slavery and Colonization in Early America. This event will take place Friday, May 12th at 5.30 at the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. This ongoing series has been made possible by a number of groups, departments, and institutions. It is first and foremost a collaboration between the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project and Brown University's John Carter Brown Library. The JCB's director, Neil Safir, sends his deep regrets for not being able to be here tonight. But from the outset, Neil has been enthusiastic about our project, eager to host events at the library and community setting, and eager to host events at the library and community settings at this wonderful venue. It's with that in mind that we collectively thank everyone here at the Southside Cultural Center, especially Val and Emma 
for, the, for so generously hosting us tonight. I'd also like to thank Tara Kingsley at the JCB for her organizational efforts. And as I previously mentioned, this is a collaborative effort. So I'd also like to thank our partners, including the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, especially Shana and Maya, who are here tonight, the History Department, the Swear Center at Brown University, and the University of Rhode Island. When community members first started gathering to discuss Rhode Island's potential involvement in the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers project, a number of questions about the markers were raised from the outset. The obvious questions of funding, content, design, and placement were and continue to be of primary concern. However, one member of our group reminded us to take a step back and ask a more fundamental question. What is the Middle Passage? This evening, we're fortunate enough to be joined by a scholar who has dedicated years to addressing this very question and to telling the intimate stories of those who experienced the absolute worst of this dark chapter in human history. Professor Shwande Mustakim is an associate professor of history and African American studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Holding a PhD from Michigan State University, Professor Mustakim is a leading expert in what she has termed Middle Passage Studies, a particular branch of Atlantic world history that focuses on the experience of captives on board vessels that traveled from continental Africa to the Americas as part of the transatlantic slave trade. Recently published in 2016 with the University of Illinois Press, her book, Slavery at Sea, Terror, Sex, and Sickness in the Middle Passage, is a vivid, heart-wrenching, raw, and real account of the brutalities and terror suffered by millions of enslaved Africans who traversed the waters of the Atlantic in the dark and dingy hulls of ships, many never to arrive in, this, never to arrive in the so-called New World. Her work reminds us that while slavery is often thought of as taking place on southern and Caribbean plantations, in port towns, or in the homes of wealthy New Englanders, the Middle Passage was a, uh, was a foundational and traumatic experience of the African diaspora. As she writes in her powerful volume, quote, the stories of, the, of incredible suffering, pain, and resiliency found in the book collectively remind us that the Middle Passage was not, the final not about the final destination, but rather the violent production of slaves throughout the journey. End quote. The work reflects the passion for which Professor Mustakin approaches the subject, subject and its resonances in our own daily lives. A dedicated educator, activist, and performer, she's quite a talented drummer from what I hear, Professor Mustakin steps, steps far beyond the pages of the historical archive and reminds us that these histories are in our midst and that we can all strive to make sure that these stories aren't forgotten through, through our own efforts and actions towards social justice in the present. Please note that copies of this wonderful book are available for purchase and signing right after the event. But for now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Shalani Mustafa. Good evening. Um, I'm so excited to be here. This was supposed to happen. There's a lot that I'm going to cover today, but I really want to open up and thank every last one of you all for coming because I drove here with my boyfriend um, from St. Louis to be here today. Oh my. That's not up the street, I think yeah. you know that. Um, <laughs> so while I'm honored that you're here, I'm honored to be back in Providence and to have made it. So again, thank you. Um, I have so many people to thank, but I really wanna thank you, Professor Riley, for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Bruin, I don't know where you went, sorry. Um, as well, and also for hearing about the Middle Passage Ceremonies and Port Markers Project. This is something that's very exciting for me to hear about because I don't get all these centered conversations on the Middle Passage, so knowing that there's more conversations that are coming. Um, and I'm really excited that there's so many institutions, so many programs, and then to be in a cultural center. This really matters. This moment matters for all of us. Um, so again, I, it, it just really matters on a lot of levels. My being here today, which again, I'm gonna expound on, but I actually really wanna let everyone know that we're standing at a really critical point in scholarship where more women have actually written on slavery than a lot of people are thinking about, meaning that literature is often largely dominated how we understand slavery. There, you've already had Professor Christy Clark Kujara come, who has written about Rhode Island. Her book came out last year, so it's falling under the shadow of Colson Whitehead's book in the sense of a novel, but here you have historians, and again, female historians that have mined the archives, myself included, um, and as well as, as Professor Wendy Warren coming. So these are my contemporaries, and there are others, as well as Marissa Fuentes. So it's a lot of deep engagement going and even more happening, but 
It's when you look at the bottom line and seeing who's authoring these conversations and who's being centered and being invited and also being cited. I cannot emphasize that enough um, because the citing and, and, and just the continued conversation. So today I see this as a conversation in my opening, not just with the book, but opening the conversation. So the talk itself, um, I don't know, it, it probably may be a little tr less traditional because I'm really trying to integrate and I will integrate more um, pop culture into this because as books influenced my book, so did popular culture. Essentially the world taught me itself and that is integrated within it. So today again, it's an honor to have collective engagement and just a beginning. It's always a beginning and it's about the continuation of the public memory um, that happens and what we make meaning of it. And so this book really is a representation of my being in the backdrop, really watching how we thought about slavery as I was teaching myself and praying that one day it would actually have an ISBN number and have a spine, and then one day it did. So honestly, I, sometimes when I need some motivation, I go look at the book like, that's my name. But, <laughs> but it's not because, you know, and I, I really want to remind us, yes, I'm here, but I'm the vessel for these stories that have come through. So if it could be the book talk, and I'd be happy. Um, and I only say that because there's so many people in this book that have been forgotten about. W.E.B. Du Bois, who we all know, and we know him as so many aspects of a scholar, a lot of people don't realize that in fact my book and W.E.B. Du Bois's book are like 200 years apart, almost to the very year. His, his dissertation on the slave trade, in fact, as a historian, he's known as a sociologist, all these other things, but his PhD is in history. And he, he wrote The Suppression of the Slave Trade in 1896, and then my book would come out in 2016. So when you begin to sort of look at the, the legacy that this book is falling in, yes, I'm falling in it, but the conversations and that have expanded um, not only from Du Bois, but so many others, black, white, but just across the world. And so again, where we are now is where race is mattering, and it has to matter all over again. And as race is mattering, so is history and memory and what we do with it, or if we throw it away and tear it down or don't talk about it or act like it didn't happen. And I've seen that. I've seen how people um, want to essentially erase this part of the history. There's so many different imaginations that happen when we talk about slavery. And so that's why it's important. And I was so excited that this conversation is going to happen at a cultural center. Because my background, my bachelor's and my master's actually is in black studies. And so when I started at The Ohio State, and one of my fellow alum and good friends is here, um, my first graduate course was at a cultural center and, and a community extension center that was connected with the Black Studies program or department that I came out of. And so there's so, you know, I began to think about like, who am I? There's so much to my story that has led to it. And there's so many different people. And if, you know, for those who've read it, you may see my acknowledgments. A lot of people comment that's the longest acknowledgments in the world. That was because for 16 years I tried to remember every single person that I met who had a hand in it. And to hear that some people were like, I cried after just reading your acknowledgments. I'm like, man, well it woke me up out of my sleep because I kept thinking, who did I make sure this person is in there or not? But that's because again, in the future I want people to know who had a hand in the shaping of this. And there's so many, again, so many people, so many circles, so many just connections that may not have happened without the boldness of taking a risk in doing this project because there were so many people who told me, this book is done, you need to find another project. Or there's no history, there's no sources, you can't find anything, get out of this archive. I've heard it all. But I still was like, no, it's a public place, I'm coming, I believe there's a history, I'm gonna prove to you that it is, and then when it is, when it's done, I'll send you a postcard, whatever's <laughs> necessary. But essentially, that this is gonna happen because you know, on one level it was about tenure, but it also, on a much bigger level is about the various people, again. And so this book covers a lot of ground. And as we were driving and coming up and I was looking at signs and just being reminded, because I've come back to Rhode Island a whole lot of times, I, I began, as I told Professor Riley, it's about all, lo all roads for me have continued to lead back to Providence, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. So there's multiple reasons, again, there's always a whole lot, um, complexities and all this, but it's the remembering and then the path itself. So Professor Riley, I'm so glad you mentioned that quote that I'm going to continue to integrate about that growing up or just hearing sort of in common conversation, it's not about the destination, it's always about the journey itself. But yet, 
it's the aspects of the journey that we share in the process. And slavery and memory is something that's so, it's so contested all the time in North American public memory. And I mention that because I've sort of operated in worlds with this book being about the British and the American slave trade. It allows me to sort of be in two nations and see how they deal with their past. And I was actually still finishing um, the dissertation when the abolition of the anniversary of the slave trade, the commemoration of the slave trade came up. And so I was in England and they were excited. Hey, we'll fly you back. Over here, no word, didn't care what you're doing, no, we don't have any room for the middle pass, it's all about plantations. Great. <laughs> so I remember though, because again, it's remembering those stories so that way we can say slavery has not always mattered. While blackness has mattered, there's still aspects to what continues to be invoked in conferences, where we find room. And, and as I was hearing you mention about deciding the content and like what content deserves or needs to be here, what is critical, what is honestly worthy of remembering. And that's what I really use the book to begin to show that all of this matters, all of it is worthy of remembering, but it's about who, it's about the various experiences. Um, so again, as I was driving in, I was beginning to remember all the various people who were involved and all the various archival documents that I had looked at when I traveled across our um, Travel across Rhode Island as I went to the, to the Bristol Historical Society and the Rhode Island Historical Society and the Newport Historical Society and the John Carter Brown Library and continued to try to get here while I went to essentially 25 archives across the world, did what other people don't do. And I didn't care there wasn't money, I'd find enough couches and friends who'd say, hey, okay, this is gonna be a book in the future. And <laughs> thankfully they believed, believed that, okay, that she's dedicated. And, and when you look at and I'm pretty proud of that bibliography um, because it's extensive and I really tried it to be rigorous in that sense of going back to almost like, and this is where the Association of the Study of African American Life and History is really impressed. And I'm, I'm a life member, a part of that, and I mention it because the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson, founded and professionalized black history. And so I come in that rigor about you don't, like, you have to have extensive footnotes. You have to have an actual bibliography that extends. And honestly, that index is amazing because I found this amazing indexer, but I really wanted people to be able to see certain words and certain just categories and concepts that had never been considered in the Middle Passage. I wanted it to be remembered. And so I want to share essentially a, what continued to frame, but to lead me back to Providence. And that connects with a so-called side project, and that it, it involves and it connects with a 1791 murder of a black woman who was left for dead in the middle of the ocean by a Rhode Island slave trader by the name of James DeWolf. So while we talk about the Browns, the DeWolfs are equally as connected, in, and they own up to it. We know that. There's the traces of the trade, and they're, again, um, you know, I have a connection with this. So they know about my work, and a lot of the family actually have, have, have written to, to thank me for it, and I'm, I'm excited, even though I know that it, it's not the most comfortable conversation, but yet the path itself, um, I've, I've, I've confronted a lot of battles that really have sort of, I say this project took 16 years, and that's because in 2000, that was when the first time, or 16, 17, yeah, that I would ever really think about the Middle Passage. And that is because of Vincent Harding's classic work in 1981, There's a River. And when I see this chapter about suicide, and he's beginning to really invoke the idea about heroism and thinking about were these people who ended their life heroes. And I began to be in battles with other colleagues who are like, they gave up. You need to forget about them. It's the ones who rose up and fought. And I'm like, no, I want to talk about the ones who so-called gave up and really begin to go in more deeper in the mind. So in fact, when I started the book, um, I started with the most depressive chapter. And that was um, the chapter on suicide, but also really the, the psyche of the mind. So this book, it covers a lot of ground, but I'm, again, sort of showing you where it started. But yet, and, and emphasizing is somehow this younger generation believes that everything can be done really quick. Mm -hmm. Impossible when you're talking about a book. Maybe a blog, but not a book. And the whole thing is that it took, t it took time to refine, if we go to that word, which is invoked, and really thinking about the refinement of bond people through this very horrific process within the middle of the ocean. And essentially, 
when people ask what is the middle passage, I always go to the slave ship experience and then immediately we know what that is. And essentially looking at that so-called middle leg but yet extending it out and really looking at, and as the book does, to go from the point of capture to the point of sale. So then the middle passage becomes so much more and then it really never ends. Because if we leave it just at, oh, well, you know, they landed and then it all ended, then we have no real understanding of the totality of slavery or the carrying of scars or none of, or in, in many ways sort of really thinking about what people bore witness to that they're never going to forget, that there may not be any archival documents that may reflect their memories, but the memories they, they still have, even if they're you know, transported in this way, no clothes, all the various things that we sort of know about the slave trade itself. But to go back to... Um, this particular woman's story, there's another classic book that, and I mention this because in being in New England, there's just a history to all of it. And I say that because this, this woman's story was found when I was reading Lorenzo Green's Negroes in Colonial New England. And it was barely a paragraph, maybe even a sentence, that James DeWolf had allegedly thrown this black woman overboard off a ship. And I ended up falling asleep, and it's probably going to sound really hokey, but I fell asleep with the book on my head, and... But I did wake up with sort of renewed eyes. Um, and that is sort of like I woke up just knowing that this woman's story needed to be told. The supernatural aspect, which I do share with some people, is that I did see a woman standing over my bed when I woke up, but I didn't, it was all sort of so quick that it was like when I saw the, the book again, all of a sudden feeling came into it because I had been looking at so many records connected with the British slave trade that I was used to sort of more of the hardcore, I would say, you know, in that sense of castrations and beheadings. And so just someone tossed overboard, it, it, at that early on, it didn't so-called fascinate or I didn't feel like I could do a whole lot. However, when I woke up, I realized what was at stake, that there's a black woman who's left for dead in the middle of the ocean because she had smallpox and who was feared and who would be blindfolded. Well, even before that, would be quarantined on the ship, would be blindfolded, gagged, tied to a chair and lowered down in the middle of the ocean and ordered by four and even more sailors who some agreed, some didn't, but nonetheless, the wolf, James, Captain Jim, as he, as he is remembered at that particular age, which, which is very young in his career, in his early 20s, he demanded, and that's actually the title of the article that came out in 2011 um, about it, and it's called She Must Go Overboard and Shall Go Overboard. And what's really interesting is that no American journal would publish this article. And I, when I submitted it different places, um, I kept getting back, there's nothing we can learn from a black woman being left you know, in the middle of the ocean. Well, duh, the slave trade is bad. So it was all this sort of, um, I don't know, it was really interesting, the commentary that would come. And so I remember getting these really terrible comments. And I'm thinking, man, this woman's left for dead out in the middle of the ocean and left, the, uh, the, ship, the, the ship Polly would sail on. She would be the only death on the ship, but that is because of a forcible death. And yet, what I did is I went and I found a British journal, um, Atlantic Studies, and the, it was published nine months later. And that now is actually one of my most popular articles. So people held on to that article for many years waiting on this book, because in fact now it's the first article in the world to center a black woman's experience in the slave trade by a historian. I cannot go back, I cannot emphasize enough by a historian because this is that time where history and what historians are doing really is mattering. It can't be sidelined. We have to really sort of think about, this wasn't about imagining. This was about me looking at documents and being led and actually finding more about, um, more about the particular case. And so in fact, I had, um, applied to be in this New England Slavery and Slave Trade Conference where in fact I got to see the late um, James Horton and all the many other scholars that then I would never think that, man, my work may fall in that line. I just wanted to be there. I just wanted to be there with all these big scholars. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate that the conference organizers actually saw value in what I wanted to do to talk about this, this woman's story. Um, and they put me on a panel with Katrina Brown to, and this is before it came out, before um, Trace of the Trade actually come out on PBS. And so I was able to have a conversation with her and also a public audience about, about the documentary and, and then also really seeing how the story really functions as folklore. And that is sort of like, again, it's always about this alleged story 
Um, and that's what really sort of drove me even more to say, okay, no, I have to uncover more. And that's where it always seemed by chance. I was in New York visiting a friend, and she was doing some research, research at the New York Historical Society. And I was like, well, let me just browse while you're doing some stuff. And then I uncovered this, like, and it's actually titled Miscellaneous. It was like this miscellaneous file that was in their slavery documents that connected back to DeWolf and all the legal connections to this murder case. And so as I was traveling all throughout these articles, I'm looking for this black woman, not finding her all the time, but finding many people and all these other stories. Again, as I would be in New England, and I would be um, throughout Liverpool and London and Jamaica and all across the Southeast. So it's so much more than one particular region. For me, I say that I'm out in the middle of the ocean because that means I've, no one wants to claim what happened on that middle passage. That's nothing to celebrate. So for me, put me out in the ocean. That way I can talk about those stories or talk about the bones that lie at the bottom of the ocean that we know, but yet we don't know how. And so in the book, um, again, I really, I tried to uncover what that process looks like. And in the introduction, I was pretty intentional in pushing back to say the way we understand slavery is really through the prison of plantations, that it's all about like we really privilege land. And we never stop to think about the making or even the mere transport. So in many ways, it's sort of like we jump off the coast of Africa and then into the plantation and say, now there's slavery. And then they made, and sort of really privileging um, plantation slave owners as making enslaved people. So when we, in, when we reinsert the middle passage back into our memory, into a larger lexicon and a whole history of slavery, then we get a much more holistic perspective. Um, or at least what I was trying to do. So the middle passage, at least on its most general way that I conceptualize, is more about it's about a middle leg, but it's about a very transformative that has even, it's not about one being worse than the other because I'm not comparing slaving voyages to plantations at all. By ending at the point of sale, I basically was trying to say, well, now plantation, oh, sorry. Now plantation scholars need to deal with what I've done. Now we need to go and rethink, why are we not talking about disabled enslaved people? Why are we not talking about the importation of those who are psychologically traumatized? Why are we not talking about more diseases than just, I don't know, even just smallpox? That there's so much that people were transported in, were affected by, um, and that even violence itself, it includes, but it's even more than ship revolts. I can't tell you how many times people would say to me, oh, I don't care about that, just tell me about how they rose up and fought back. I'm like, oh, great, but then you're missing the total other part of this conversation that like even for instance, that I talk about hangings, mm -hmm. how enslaved people hung themselves, or for the first time to get a sustained conversation on abortion, mm -hmm. or miscarriage, or actually the refusal of enslaved people. We assume that any black person was just valuable, and that was, that's not the case. I really tried to tease that out to show that some were left behind, some were killed on the spot because no one would want them. What do we do with that history? And then, and this is on both sides, but it was even, my audacity, as one scholar told me, mm -hmm. that you have the audacity to actually talk about how Africans actually would have a hand in killing some of these refused slaves. And I said, well, just as we need to talk about the coming of many people, Europeans, Americans, the Spanish, the Portuguese, we need to talk about how societies began to transform and that human value reduced so that you would become centrally involved in a system that may provide money or an opportunity or class or status, but at the same time, ripping people from their homes and essentially supplying demand overseas, really sort of looking at the big picture and the intricacies within all of um, the people involved, it then, and then to really try to humanize that someone is out bathing and that they would be snatched up or someone is sleeping in the bed or even playing corn or all these various things, but just the day to day and really trying to show that even from the beginning, the middle passage itself and the way in which we think about it is not just the moment that people board ships because there's a whole process. And again, in fact, I'm not saying that I tried to rename the system, but I really thought about how a friend of mine told me that the concept of Atlantic slave trade was one of the worst terms. And I thought about, well, but that's what people remember. And so when I was writing the book, and, or I should say that at the end is I thought about what is this? Because I have all these stories and you know, I try to have an argument, but what is this? And that's where I began to, I came to this understanding of what I call the human manufacturing process. And so within that, while I'm talking about the making 
an unmaking of slaves or enslaved, whatever term that we would use to talk about those who are forced into trade, who are of African descent, what I did is one day it just, it felt so simple and I said, but when you take the simple way of looking at history, it allows you to see the complexities. And so one day, I, I don't know how, but manufacturing, and I really thought about what does that mean? And so essentially putting goods together and then packaging them and then the whole transport and delivery and sales. So all the different phases of what I was calling, again, this human manufacturing process to show that it's not just the merchants that are connected with the trade itself, but it's also really even more than we need to consider slave ship sailors. So this is where Emma Christopher's work, slave ship sailors and their African cargoes, and Marcus Redeker and all the people, Jeffrey Bolster, who look at sort of this maritime world, but also thinking about slave ship sailors, then we get to see they have really more of the making and the hand in the making of enslaved people, I think, than we've considered. So um, again, and, I, and, and in thinking about that as, as it's been interesting, once the book has now been out, how people perceive the book. And a lot of people are like, man, this is great, this is a book about enslaved people. And they never talk about this book, actually goes at, in depth about so-called the white side. And I say that because we're looking at the literate world to sort of understand how are people reading and understanding Africa and the slave trade or revolts. But then also really thinking about how slave ship sailors, how they interacted with, um, whether we're talking about on the business side or even trying to manage disease or even on the side of brokers. And that sense of once people are important, they can't be sent back. You know, how do you sort of deal with that? So this book is about so many people and yet so many people who have never really been put together or even been included. So it is the first book of many kinds. It's the first book to center black women, the first book to center children and elderly and disease and disabled and the dying and really to even in the title have the word terror. It's one of, it's, it's, it's going to be, you're going to find it more in the future, but I really took a risk and I demanded, give me terror back in my title because this is the age that we're living in and we have to begin to think about its long history and most especially in black history to give it more of a deeper understanding. Um, and so in that way, when I sort of look at the evolution, when I got to the end, I thought about how do you conclude? How do you conclude all the various aspects that you you try to send to the people. We're looking at sort of the various aspects of the body. And that's been very interesting to see how people, um, they, they have really received my treatment of the body. The body, as I say in the epilogue, it gets more attention in this book probably more than ever before. And that's because health becomes very centered where I'm looking at environmental health. Once bond people were forced on ships and we're looking at all the various a aspects of food and cleanliness, or we're looking at tornadoes, um, or we're just sort of looking or thinking about bacteria and vermin and then how it's the, the aspect it can have on what people are able to consume. But then, you know, really one of my most, the chapter I'm most proud about, if you will, is entitled Blood Memories. And it came, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty particular about titles because I want people to remember them. I want them to have feeling. And I wrote this book with the intent of trying to have feeling where and it, it, again, so even beyond the acknowledgments to hear people say like, I had to take a moment after I read your book, I was crying. I'm like, man, we're not even allowed to cry. It almost feels like it. Like when we do this stuff, that there is no space for it, but yet this, this, this is a blood-drenched history. And so we have, and we should be permitted to understand that it created a, a multitude of emotions, but even more pain and suffering and crying and even the, the thought of death or you know, just, just all the various aspects of the human experience. Um, so when I begin to sort of think about even where is all this going to go? What's the goal? What do I want? Because people even begin to ask that. And for me, in writing it, I wanted the stories to be told because after a while, when you're writing and showing up every day, you're like, is this ever going to finish? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, but I knew, like, okay, keep showing up and it will. But... Hmm. I really, again, wanted this to open up so that way no one could ever say it didn't happen. So that way we can't unknow. Because once you read it, the stories will stay with you. It doesn't matter if it's one or many. And it's interesting to see, like, which ones. And, and again, honestly, it's tons. And so it's a lot of people talk about how harrowing it is. And it makes me feel like I did my job because there's no kindness. There's nothing kind at all in this book. In fact, I was questioned about that a couple years ago. 
And if you're looking for it, you won't find that in the index. I can't <laughs> tell you that, <laughs> among other things. But, um, you know, when I pull back for a moment and sort of really think about, because the, the second part of, of our conversation today, this is where I want to sort of bring you where I have sort of been a little bit more, again, through the visuals. And that is both, when I say popular culture, this is about the visual and it's also about music. And so, in fact, in chapter five, and, and we'll sort of end with the music and talk more about that um, as you all get to see about the book soundtrack. But when I think about the many influences, there's so many. And so, if someone were to say, well, what book would you suggest? And like, there's just, it's so many. And yet, the influences I realized were happening all the time. I just wasn't aware that I was a sponge that was remembering and sort of knowing how things would fit. And I say that because even movies such as like, under Siege with Denzel Washington or looking at Blown Away, like I actually was studying terrorism and how we, how we see it, even in the 90s, and then they began to take on, and so then all these, honestly, I love good writing and I love good TV, and you get that kind of with premier TV. So Homeland, Billions, Penny Dreadful, all these popular shows begin to help me to see the supernatural to begin to see between worlds, to begin to think about how financial greed can lead someone mm -hmm. to certain extremes and what they will do to mm -hmm. exact violence, to begin, mm -hmm. you know, to elevate their status. So again, sort of looking at TV was the world. I'm like, man, okay, all this is, okay, all right, terrorism can take its function here, we can hide here. So again, moving between, as I say in the book, sort of moving between the worlds or recovering secrets of the dead and the living you begin to sort of have a lot of conversations. You have a lot at stake and even more with slavery. But for me, um, really making a conscious effort for people to understand that this is sort of what I I've, I've, have dealt with. I opened my book talking about that this book is marked by death on all sides. And I say that because when I started the book, um, I had a cousin pass away and, he, and, and in fact drowned in his own body because he had had an infection. And yet, I just started this, for the dissertation, I had started the chapter on disease and mortality. And it was just devastating to, um, to sort of begin there and then have that death happen. And then also to lose both of my grandmothers towards the finishing of the book, to also bail out my father while in jail. Um, and also to begin to start taking care of my mother, who is a five-time stroke survivor. So I've seen a lot of life and continue to in all the process, but yet again for me writing, whether it was about slavery or not, writing was how I rechanneled what was happening and making sense. And it allowed me to see again more of these layers that I could say that the slave trade is really the first iteration that we see in the mass detentioning of black people mm -hmm. in a whole other way, but I wouldn't have known that without my father going to jail when I was 11 and having to hide that. And then, you know, living with this whole prison industrial system and sort of the meaning of that, which is all about labor, it's all about money, I would get that much more deeply because of, you know, just these challenges that allow my mind to expand in those ways. But again, rechanneling that energy. So I share all that. And also being now tenured. And I will also add that I'm actually the first African American at my institution in the history department to go through tenure track and wow. to get tenure. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so there's been a lot of big, just a lot of big. There's a lot of big living. There's a lot of big decisions. There's a lot of, I mean, this is a big book. It may not, I don't know if it looks long to some people or not, but it's big because of the weight and because of where and how deep that I tried to go. Um, and, but yet, again, when I go back to it and I think about we all live, we all see, we all hear, we all feel, and we endure, but then it also, again, I can't help, but you know, I always use the language about rechanneling because if not, we don't move, if we don't move past anger, we don't move past the sorrow, then we can't move forward. Um, and in being in the profession and also being sort of just in the world, again, people say things, people but they don't always realize it at time. And I only mention that because I was at a conference in Mississippi. I knew what I was walking into when I was in Mississippi. I just didn't expect that, yeah, again, the audacity. But to hear a scholar say, well, I mean, slavery wasn't that bad. They had clothes, they had a house, 
They had food. I mean, what are we complaining about? You know, why are we remembering this? They had everything that they needed and not one scholar stood up. Wow. Mm. I mean, big name scholars and I'm one of two black people in the entire conference. And most times I am, I have been the only. And it's okay because I get along with everybody, but at the same time, I'm sort of like, man, at times I'm not certain that our conversations are really about black people. It almost feels like we're talking about aliens. Mm. And so that's where, again, being very intentional about Again, it's not about me, but it's going to be about these stories. So what you're not going to get is you're not going to be getting in this particular book. I'm not counting people. I'm not counting experiences. I'm saying if it was two or 200, what did they go through? Did that, if that person hung himself or herself, what was it? Or if a, a, a someone, or there were two guys, in fact, that I've uncovered that they, they died from their, their, um, their scrotums were to torn. If we left their, that, the, the final moments of their life at two people died, that wouldn't tell you anything. Mm -hmm. But when I mention, and again, that's that just trying to uncover those stories or even those words or even those just little fragments of history that have not made it in other conversations or other books, I wanted to try to pick the ones that would be like, whoa, what? Like, really? You know, because they've always been there, and I'm really, and I, I really want to remind all of us that I'm using the same sources that all the scholars have used. Mm -hmm. It's about the questions mm -hmm. that we ask. And again, how many places, the questions, and then the rigor that you'll put into it. So for me, I tried to have rigor, and I only say that, to, to try to ask the questions that we're uncomfortable with. Meaning that if we talk about so-called beautiful slaves, well then what about someone who doesn't fall in that category? So then, again, to go back to even thinking about the word refuse, thinking about refuse and how and, and what its broader meanings of trash, discarded, forgot about it, so that you would find stories of, like, uh, in chapter two, um, talking about two black women who were murdered. So again, one taken to a bush and the other head is cut off because no one would buy them. So again, there's nothing laughable, there's nothing funny, there's nothing feel good, but at the same time, it's about what we do with that. Um, and so again, when I, I kind of now want to um, transition to, I want you all to see a clip. So I end the book, um, and after we sort of move through this pop culture aspect, I would like for us to open up, obviously, please, um, for us to dialogue and I can talk more deeply because again, I can't anticipate all of, you know, we, you may want to hear, um, but this visual is really important because my epilogue, I title it, The Frankenstein of Slavery. A meditation on memory. There are two reasons why I did that. One, I had a really good conversation with a friend of mine, um, and we were just really wrestling with. Uh, we've known each other since we were 11, and she's a director, and we just really talked about like why is it that no one wants to remember the slave trade? And then that's when we sort of. I was like, man, it's almost like Frankenstein, you know. And so we were just sort of going back and forth about essentially something so. <laughs> ugly, that you just want to hide it away and act like it didn't happen. I'm like, so when we think about slavery, there are almost degrees or places we won't go, but the middle passage is what I call the Frankenstein of slavery, that we will go all day remembering southern plantations, never even thinking about New England, never thinking about the north because the north is great, but the south is where they did it all wrong. But <laughs> in thinking about the, the meaning and the silences of slavery. Um, I was watching Penny Dreadful, and there is, and so what we're gonna, it's, um, it should still be up. Um, it's a clip, it's essentially when Frankenstein meets, um, Frankenstein's monster. And this is again, a, it's a British um, television show, but when I watched it, and I heard it, so hopefully we'll have the, the sound effects where you all can hear it. Um, when we, not yet, not yet. Um, I just wanted to warn you because it's bloody, it's loud, I hope it can get really loud, but I, it's gonna create, it creates a whole other sensory experience in the sense of, no, this is not an enslaved person, but in thinking about, and actually this, this particular episode is called Resurrection, and so I open up actually quoting from Penny Dreadful and essentially, if the history of the slave trade in the, in the Middle Passage were to meet, sort of us or meeting sort of the, what put all this in motion? You know, the father, the mother, all of the, the sort of institutional push of what the slave trade meant, then this is sort of how a conversation could go. But nonetheless, I sort of pair this a lot, or I paired it with my students in the book, so that way when you finish, or even if as an entrance into the book, so we'll watch this, 
and I'll, I'll um, and it's just a short clip, maybe six minutes, but really pay attention to what you're seeing and what you're hearing. Probably going, it was going a little slow, but if you can kick that out. Can you hear? What he had said was, your firstborn has returned, Father. Hmm. Okay. Well, hopefully this will work. The second part is more pop culture, and if not, you know, we just go with the flow. Um, hmm. All right. Well, while that's pulling up, again, that this 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 clip, which um, if not, I'll I'll encourage you all to to at least look at this particular episode early on. Um, yeah, Penny Dreadful, season one, episode three. In there, and I really hope this comes on. We'll maybe even close out. I'm even fine with us closing out the other tabs because those are, okay, all right, that's fine. Yeah, Showtime, anytime, sometimes can be a little challenging. But anyway, um, what was I gonna go through? Because in here, what's interesting is that you hear Frankenstein's monster talking about how being trapped in the basement or being left, how in seeing the world through a window, what that taught him. And it sort of matched a lot of what I was beginning to sort of see, that he's like even seeing how people didn't value one another, how you would mistreat animals. But the fact that Frankenstein essentially would create him and then leave him. And so that's where I was... Um, having almost this meditation in my mind. And I actually will read, if we want, um, from even a part, while the, again, while that's sort of pulling up, where I, I, I kind of explain it, where I talk about that the slave ship experience concretely parallels the abdominable, ab abdominable, I'm sorry, yeah, and man-like monster comprised of the stitched together parts of the dead and living embodied in the impermeable fusion of both the creator, Victor, and his crea creation, The Monster, known best to many through Mary Shelley's iconic work, Frankenstein. Employing a much more bodied perspective on the past through symbolism enables a theoretical overlay to better decipher the construction of slavery's body to which the concept of the Frankenstein of slavery takes on much greater meaning and use when decoding the past of the slave trade. So and here I say that if Victor Frankenstein and The Monster are seen and therefore historically imagined as perhaps one and the same, interconnected and separated through mere images of the mind, then the middle passage represents more than a moment, a ship or one or even one voyage, but instead an ongoing duality made up of multitudes of people, sh ships, crowds, and destination. Therefore, this integrated world of creator and monster are embodied as and through the human manufacturing process um, Historically traced throughout this book, then the choices, decisions, and movement of money, people, goods, and ideas that sponsored an ugly and horrid history by consequently, consequently fueling a devastating war to forge a slaving empire becomes much more clear. And again, I'm really sort of talking about the war of the soul um, and the sense of how we grapple with this memory and sort of going in even more. Uh, I may have started over. So if you hit maybe like go up to where I see. Okay. So, well, all right, let's see if we can click on maybe one of the videos. Uh, click on maybe Sweet Jester. Let's see. It could be, if not, it just skip. Oh, I can't. Okay, so if we can, maybe this one will play. And I want to open with this because this is where music, and I'll be able to. So everybody knows Joe Scott, right? And this is an old song. Um, huh? Oh, did it? Oh, okay. Well, I can hear it. Yeah. 
Huh. Well, go ahead and close the blinds. Well, yeah. Okay. All right. Where is the sound? Can you all hear that? No? Okay, all right. Well, we'll just save it. I think the visuals aren't gonna work, or the sound is not gonna work. But, okay. Well, I guess while we're trying to hear it, um, this, so when I was writing the dissertation, music actually was centrally integrated but I didn't realize how later on it would take a whole other aspect. I only say that because living in Michigan, you don't have a whole lot sort of going on when you're in grad school. And I became very immersed in a lot of it. And so Jill Scott's song. So she's talking about run the ocean. Um, and essentially, I was hearing all these lyrics that placed it back almost into the slave trade, if you imagine, sort of being out in the middle of the ocean and trying to swim miles. to cause that one. And so what I've done, again, these lyrics are in the original dissertation. They're not in the book. Um, and so we can go to the Lupe fiasco, if we can hear that one. So again, with Jill Scott, it was sort of really thinking about resistance, but thinking about it through music. Then we get to Lupe fiascos, the, the, uh, the pool. And this one is where disease actually comes up in these lyrics. And he's talking about them very clearly. Disease running in every direction. Um, and essentially like quarantine and everyone sort of, you know, trying to fit it. in here they're saying like don't let them in and that was sort of connecting in my mind with chapter seven with a tide of bodies and we can pause that um really thinking about how nobody wanted enslaved people who were diseased and sort of thinking about the quarantine and that there's no there's no cure we can close that one out. um and we can go ahead to the book soundtrack all right so um anyway i mentioned about you know, I guess for a moment it's taken us down memory lane since some of these songs are a little older now for those that do know them. Um, now, that said, uh, this is more contemporary. This is where, as the book was finishing, I got bold and said, well, I'm going to do what I want, and this book is wrapped up. And I had actually started a band, joined, you know, got some people, we started drumming, and so now I'm in a percussion band, the only female drummer. Um, and we have been not only playing, but I just started drumming. Meaning I've been hosting a drum circle on campus um, and opening up to the community for years. And also sometimes requiring students unless they complain. My goodness, who doesn't want to drum? But anyway, um, 
it led to, again, creating this band and then saying, you know what, I'm going to take it back old school and we're going to have a soundtrack. Sort Because of, I, you know, I grew up with those soundtracks that people would buy to movies and I thought, well, why don't I create even a book soundtrack? No one even uses that idea, that, that concept, that language. Let me be among the first. And what I've done, in fact, is that if you'll see that all the chapters of the book are listed because I selected songs um, that we had channeled. And when I say channeled, that means that once you hear it up here, like we can't replicate it. It becomes like what sort of comes through on spirit, if you will. Um, but each chapter or each song I chose specifically to match the emotion and the feeling and sort of the sensory experience that I created through writing. And so in every chapter, and it goes, um, you know, intro through, all the way through the epilogue and then towards the end. And it has an integration of not only me reading from, um, at the end, I'm just reading from actually parts of the epilogue. A lot of people thought it was a poem. And I was like, no, it's actually from the epilogue. But that said, there is actually a good friend of mine who, when I first wrote the first draft for the book, in fact, he had channeled a poem that he had wrote um, that's on there as well. So it's free. It's available online if you just do Slavery at Sea book soundtrack. You won't find another one but this one. Um, so again, I was trying to play it. I've, you know, I'm sorry that you all aren't really able to sort of hear it. But with headphones, it's great. So if you're inclined, it's on Bandcamp. It's free and available. And the band name is Amalgamy, which is actually alchemy plus amalgamation and really sort of thinking about you know, sort of the mixing of things, but taking it to a whole other cosmic level. And essentially really taking an effort to say that history needs to be more than the flat written, that it needs to add even more of the sensory experience. And again, um, music is centered in the book. I just never thought that what I was writing about, I actually would start doing. So to talk about the polyrhythmic sort of using of drums um, or drum itself as a portal and opening between worlds that now, um, through the drumming and different things that I've been doing that I'm beginning to sort of really understand that um, sort of in its, in its full context. But anyway, I will, I will end begin here, meaning that I want to open up for you all to ask any question, you know, about, I don't know, about the book itself or even about, about what you've heard. I'm happy to share because there's just so much. I just don't want to put anybody to sleep. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, I... I will recommend that. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if there's hands. I just see people waving. Um, so, but anybody, I'm open to it. Sure. Hi. Hi. We may have a North Carolina connection. I'll talk to you about that later. Oh, but really? Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's so funny when you were in here before it started. I was like, she looks so familiar, but I don't think I've met you. So it's so funny it's about North because Carolina. Because I look like I'm from North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I, well, I don't know what that would look like, but okay. <laughs> but uh, um, I haven't read your your book or your research sure. at all, but speaking about suicide, mm -hmm. were you surprised in your studies to find? Not to find more suicide? You said not to find more? Yeah. Well, I was actually pretty content with how many that I found for the chapter. It was definitely more than one and two. I, I don't mean what you found personally. I yeah. mean to, to find oh, sort of record, like in the history. To find record that, that oh, existed and um, was documented. Yeah, you know, to be honest with you, because like Terry Snyder, she's had her book. Then there was an older article by Daniel Walker on suicidal tendencies, sort of. He was talking about it with an African folklore. To, so I'm answering your question as we're moving forward in the sense that I was having to work with little, but at the same time, it was about really sort of placing myself in it. So, but suicide oftentimes is difficult to carry out, even in these ships, it's an intimate space. So in that way, um, it, it, you know, it's already gonna be difficult to sort of catalog how many to get at that precise number, because we don't know how many attempts that there may be versus those who were able to sort of follow through. Um, but I wasn't, I don't know, as time went on, I just felt, because I had outgrown the conversation that was just suicide, meaning that that's where I was originally. But I became more invested in showing that there is more to all of this, that if, that if, if the way we understand this is really only suicide and ship revolts, then how do we expand this even more so you have a deeper understanding? So even in the chapter, again, that's about ship revolts, I was very strategic and made it about violence, 
but I included other things to make, to challenge our understanding of, of violence itself as well, to think about poisoning and how internally that would cause a violent disruption of all the various things, um, as well as abortion and, and, and imagining, but also really sort of thinking about abortion on a ship because we only imagine those in plantations because we think black women only attempted that there, but what happens when we imagine that there? So, meaning that, I, we will go further. I think more people will dig in the same way that I have. If I could dig this far, I feel like other, it's gonna open up and I'm getting emails and I'm seeing a lot of grad students like, man, you are like renewing my energy and the possibilities. I'm like, there's so many topics out there. But if you can get off Google and actually go to an archive, <laughs> then you will find that. And that's what I, you know, that's what I continue to offer because I got slammed and I wanna offer this to sort of even show how the resiliency one of my readers' reports was terrible and said that this was like one of the worst books, that, one of the, that there hadn't been a good book on the slave trade since 1969, and that um, you know, having to think about female bodies, this, that, and the other was a waste of time. Wow. And they were like, who is Shawani Musakim? She, did, she must not have a PhD in history. In fact, let me tell her that um, she probably did this whole thing online on yeah. Google and I'm sitting there like, man, they're like, all these archives listed, what in the world? But this person dug in because they didn't want this book published. Mm -hmm. They were hell bent on making sure this book didn't get published. And so, in fact, I walked, I, I almost quit the profession because it was so, like, I actually emailed the vice provost and was like, if this is why I leave, this is why. Because this is unnecessary, it became very personal. It became, again, questioning if I have a PhD and, you know, let me tell you what archive research is. And so, in fact, I left, I sort of left my life. I left for a two week silent meditation mm -hmm. and I called my editor and told her, hey, I don't know if y'all are gonna see me when we come back, I don't know about this book. And when I went to this two week silent meditation, I found myself and I came back much more renewed. No TV, no phone, no nothing. However, the other thing is that I came back the very day, the very weekend, in fact, that Mike Brown had been murdered. So I was coming in absolute chaos and yet having to find that inner peace. And I came out sort of on fire. And so in that way, um, I knew I had what I needed, but it then became the fire to move forward in that way. So again, to go back to the suicide, I'm like, suicide, all of it, this needs to happen now. But in going in, I actually was sort of broken down, like, man, you know, it's about how we sort of withstand and endure and then believe that this is possible in these ways. So again, maybe outside of suicide, but really thinking about resiliency and then what it takes to sort of endure, you know, and again, for me, through the book process. So thank you for that. Hi. And you make me think of the amoeba, the black woman as an amoeba. Oh. <laughs> and keeps on being resilient because that's Over the label that they keep, they, yeah. and everybody. Yeah. He's putting on black women and how the hell do they think we survived all of this time yeah. through all of this? Mm -hmm. and, and for people who actually do make demeaning statements like that, yes, they give me fire. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, like my Angelou, I am not giving up. Yeah. Right. And, and we can. Yeah, and, and we can. And of course, you know, we are strong. Mm -hmm. We have been the foundation for a lot of people, mm -hmm. not just, you know, uh, our children, but our, our men, the white people, everybody. Mm -hmm. We have been the foundation, and they keep putting us, and keep wanting to put us at the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. So your book, I hope it will birth tons of books like this. Oh, thank you. And then I actually have the intro, The Birth of Slavery at Sea. Because it's, it's giving birth to whole new conversations and then we think about how the Middle Passage has historically or in many ways been conceptualized as this womb, as this birth of so much that would bring people together. And you know, I have to share, the first time I ever presented, ever, it was actually on black women and ship revolts. So it was a pack room just like this. And, and, and in fact, the whole panel dropped out. So that was my introduction to <laughs> academic presenting. And, but everyone in the audience was like, we were here for your paper. I'm like, what? I'm like, first year grad student, okay? <laughs> so you know, I was like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna hold this down. However, then afterwards, someone came up to me. Oh my God, I totally forgot black women were on slave ships. Yeah. Yeah. Black women were revolts, you said? No, they said, I totally forgot black women were on slave ships. Meaning like, I only think of men. Yeah. And, I, and I, then I thought about, that being said to me, and I thought about just the context of all that, and I was like, well, I could think of work then. If, you, if people are believing or forgetting that black women are on slave ships, and that 
for years, I've actually taught teachers and showed them that we rely on these images that really privilege these adult black men because that's the narrative that we sort of leave and we find, I don't know what we find in it because what we do is we exclude all these others and we create an iconic history just, just on one group of people who were boarded on ships with so many others. So yeah, I hope it lights me on fire. You know, honestly, I, I hope more, I hope, because students matter and the future matters, I really hope that it inspires future writers to take those risks and say, we can do this, we need to, and be anchored though, however, in the rigor. I cannot emphasize that enough because I'm telling you it's waning a little bit in the classroom as we go on. And that is because of social media. But that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, again, we, when we get more foot traffic back in the archives and minds can be blown again, unless we then allow archives to close, then the history will fade with it. So, um, so while technology evolves and we can better access black women in history, it also means something to go to these places and begin to um, understand you know, all the dimensions of those histories. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah. I, I just really appreciate also, you know, putting black women and your mention, even saying children, mm -hmm. you know, in the conversation oh, and in the story. Um, years ago, I was asked to do some storytelling around all that was happening with the Amistad. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was just a little footnote of the four children. You yeah. know, now there's more research about it, but as a storyteller at that time, I, I wasn't doing tons of, you know, in the archives research, but yeah. imagining. Yeah. What was it like for Margaret as a little girl to be on that ship? And so Absolutely. I told the story from that perspective, and wow. people went, "I never yep. thought, of that thought about that." Because you don't, you yeah. Know? And that's why this, I'm, I'm excited mm -hmm. to. Oh, thank to you. Be in and, and be so yeah. Thank it, you well, that. you're welcome. Again, I warn you, you'll be plunged deep by about chapter four. You <sighs> are like, it's dark, but you feel. You feel as you read and you see more. Um, so thank you. I'm 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 glad that it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I have a question about um, the music that you made in yes. response to your book or with your book. One of the things that I found in looking through archives and trying to find particularly histories of women of color sure. is that one of the things that's really difficult is that you often see it through financial records. Mm. You see it through the eyes of men. Yeah. Um, like those are the records that exist and yeah. that are archived and that are survived. So you don't often hear mm. first hand accounts, for example, in your book of black women who are talking about the, their experience in particular. Yeah. Do you feel like in making art with your book that you're able to reconstruct that part of the archive that is lost and irrecoverable? Or what is the, I think it's really interesting that you make art with your book. So I'm just wondering like, what is that, that relationship like for you? Thank you. Um, I have to say, to be bold and go that level to even say book soundtrack definitely has opened itself to whole new avenues. Almost immediately, it was like a skyrocket in terms of people's response to it because they were like, I compare this in the classroom, it becomes more of an educational opportunity. So it's more that once it was done and we put it up on Bandcamp, that I began to understand the power of really what was there even more. Because for me, it was that drumming was my outlet. It was my therapy. It was my, you know, just a way to connect in whole other ways that didn't require a whole lot. But then over time, um, now, sort of where I stand, it is art. I am a musician. I, I very much enjoy it. And then there's just ways that in connecting it to history, we then allow for more of just an integrated sensory experience, more 3D, more, again, than just essentially what history sometimes has been flat. So um, it allows more texture that, uh, well, you already hit it. You already hit it on the head in the beginning of your question. And so in that way, in thinking about me being a female, um, it takes on whole other ways. Uh, but you're right to say that. I mean, it's so difficult to find females in these sources. And even more, particularly in, in, in this particular book. But it's interesting, what came to mind is that when I was in South Carolina, I had uncovered, in fact, a female slave trader. But I just thought to myself, well, it, it can't fit in the book, but someone else can do that. And I remember thinking like, man, you know, people need to know about that. But then when I was here, I was uncovering so many sort of everyone should know. So it's just a matter of those that will take the step and say, okay, I'm gonna gather those documents and begin to put those together. Um, 
I think with all the new books coming out, that it's going to open up more, though. I think it's going to lend itself to more, that more people are going to ask, like, okay, how can I go see those sources on, on women, on, again, females? And, and I, I, I even wanted to follow up and just sort of say females because within the book, I argue really, I push back against a lot of what scholars do in talking only about women and men in the slave trade and saying that a two-year-old girl is not a woman. So at what point did we begin to sort of broaden out the categories, thinking about teenagers again, thinking about toddlers, thinking about infants, thinking about all the various people. So um, I, I think that more will be coming, though, in that regard. As hard as it is, I think it's then going to possibly force or encourage more archivists to really center that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to um, pick up a little bit on the music Oh this sure. Notion, and also remembering what you said about this is a one. This was a one-time thing. Like yeah. we drummed it for this, and that's yep. it. Yeah. And so what occurs to me is that that's really the ritual release. It is. That yeah. comes with this piece. Yeah. And that that is such a critical part yeah. of of us really engaging with this part of history, which comes Absolutely. to this whole part of like. We don't want to go there because yeah. it's too painful, because yeah. it's not ancient history. We carry it in our DNA. Yeah. And unless we have a way to address, address the terror and transform it mm -hmm. for ourselves. And that's where music is. That's yeah. where the music is. That's where the ritual, whatever it is, um, is yeah. that piece. And I'm saying that as we're thinking about you know, engaging in our middle passage. Whatever. Well, and I was telling, um, I was telling Matt that too. Like drumming is one of the first things that would come to mind when we're talking oh, yeah. about ritual m remembrance and in, in any of that. Um, absolutely, yeah, exactly. Release. I know. Yes, we can only hold the terror so much, right? Oh yeah, right. Exactly. You got to be able to to channel it, release it, any of that. Yeah. And it almost seems like sometimes it seems like yeah. uh, we're we're taught often that we need to find metaphors, and we need, especially in writing, yeah. that we need to find metaphors to soften the blow so that mm. people will be able to deal with it. Yeah. And I remember when Adrian Hall at Trinity Repertory Company, the that started here, when I joined the company in 1973, he would do things like put a big chunk of meat on stage. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. It, it was just one of those things depicting Thomas Jefferson's nephew, oh, Lou wow. Lewis, yeah. killing a slave one night because he got pissed off because one of the slaves broke his mother's teacup. Oh, wow. And so he chopped this boy up at the slave in the meat house. Okay. And one night with Adrian to depict it, and not to soften the blow, actually. To the bring the meat. A big piece of meat, and the actor was chopping away, chopping, and those wow. blood and those bones were like spilling out. Well, to replicate, and, and, yeah. And so he did try to soften, mm -hmm. but a lot of times I have noticed mm -hmm. in different things I've gone through sure. that, I mean, somebody's always trying to, like, you can't say it. So so forceful, you can't be so bold, it's going to offend people, and they're going to oh. like, you know, freak out and everything else. Well, right now, I don't give a shit. Okay. <laughs> well, I think for me, that's where the rechanneling came in, that you move through this phase of, how do I not know, and you're angry, and you're this, and, and then people always ask me, like, well, how can you be around all kinds of people? And I'm like, very easily, because I've allowed my consciousness to move to a higher level that I'm not right. affected. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But you are allowed to feel. And again, that's what we're not taught. Yes. We have to remember to feel that when you feel history, you don't forget that. That's right. yeah. that's and even seeing and hearing has its own. But when you feel it, when it sort of like really rocks your soul, you're like, oh, my God, like you're not going to forget that. So, so. It, doesn't, it doesn't stop us from loving all our people, our multicultural family. Yeah, you got to, still got yeah. to release that. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I mm -hmm. hate to cut off discussion, but I do want to make sure there's plenty of time for uh, Professor Mustafa to sign some of the copies of the books. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't picked up your copy yet, I can't think of a better page than what you just heard. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah. also, please keep that. There is another event coming into the space. We do yes, have to be up right. by 7:30, so I want to make sure there's plenty of time if you'd like to say hello to Professor Mustafa. But for now, please join me in thanking her one more time. Oh. Okay.